Christian belief says that God is up to things in the world. He's bringing his kingdom and he wants all people in all places to follow him. So how much does he care about how we accomplish that? Or to put it another way, we know where God is going. So for Christians, do the ends justify the means? A few months ago, the son of a very prominent American politician suggested that it was time for Christians to stop turning the other cheek because it just isn't getting us where we need to go. And so the question becomes, are there times where for God to accomplish his ends, it is counterproductive for us to turn the other cheek? And this, I mean, the same question can apply to a lot of things in our life. If being truthful all the time means I wouldn't advance as quickly at work, should we be able to fudge the truth as long as no one is getting hurt? Or if we're choosing a, a leader for our church, is it better to choose a charismatic leader with great business skills, even if they have some issues with pride and gentleness, since presumably financial skills and char charisma uh, will bring us better financial health and more people through the door, and that's the goal, right? In Genesis 12, we meet Abram, who would later become Abraham. And God tells him, I have big plans for you. Obey me and leave the land you're in and travel to this new place that I will show you. And there I will make your family so big that your descendants will be a great nation. They'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And in a tremendous act of faith, Abraham, Abram does it. Abram goes to where God has called him, but there is a problem. Abram's wife, Sarai, is barren. She cannot have kids. Time passes and there's still no heir. And with no heir, it's hard to grow into a nation. At this point, Abram and Sarai come to a point where they think, oh, I see, God needs our help. So they conspire to help God out with his plans. Uh, Abram gets a slave pregnant in what is arguably rape in order to help God. Uh, and I think we have to ask the question of, do we think that God was up in heaven thinking, ah, that Abram, such an industrious fellow, look at him making the difficult choices. Abram isn't acting in faith in God when he tries to work things out on his own. He's relying on his own understanding and in his worldly attempts to accomplish what he thinks God's will is, he acts in a way that God finds abhorrent. He abuses a woman who has no power to say no. And then when she gets pregnant, they treat her so poorly that she runs away into the wilderness. Them doing things their own way leads to nothing but grief and bitterness for Abram, Sarai, and especially Hagar the slave. Or fast forward to the book of Samuel and think of King Saul. Saul had been ruling for two years when he picked a fight with the Philistines, a neighboring kingdom, which turned out to be like kicking a beehive. All the Philistines came out to fight and Samuel the prophet told Saul, don't go into battle until I perform a sacrifice to the Lord for us. I'll be there in seven days. So Saul waits. And for seven days, the enemy gets closer and closer. And for seven days, his army gets smaller and smaller as his men look around and think, I'm out. So he figures, the Lord wants a sacrifice, right? I need these soldiers to win the battle and God wants Israel to win, right? So what's the big deal if I ignore this one little command? But God sees this as a really big deal. Saul performing the sacrifice himself when he's not the priest and when he was told to wait is the reason God takes the kingship away from him and gives it to David. God cares immensely, not just about what his people are trying to accomplish, but how they are doing it. King Saul and Abraham tried to accomplish God's purposes without his methods, which, I mean, let's be honest, is completely understandable and relatable. They didn't have God's viewpoint. They didn't know what he was working out. They didn't know his plans. And when we're waiting and the pressures of the world are mounting, it gets really easy to start justifying our actions. From a worldly perspective, what Jesus calls us to do seems completely foolish. Everything about the way the world operates says that when, man, someone, when someone hits you, you hit back harder to teach them a lesson. Otherwise, you'll be taken advantage of, right? Jesus might say that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, but we all know that the real way to be first is to be first. Jesus might model for us how those in power should give power away, but we know that if we give up power, we're never getting it back. Jesus, the baby born in the stable to Mary and Joseph is talked about so much that it's easy for us to miss its significance. When Jesus came, he could have come as a Jewish leader like the high priest. 
He, he could have come as part of Herod's household and been the king of the region immediately with the power and privilege that comes along with it. I mean, for that matter, he could have come as the Roman emperor, a Caesar. Think about how much he could have accomplished as the ruler of the greatest superpower on the planet at the time. Instead, he came as an infant born to an at best middle class family in an oppressed people group way off on the fringes of the empire. And then he didn't do any of the things that we expect from someone who was setting out to transform the world. And yet, 400 years later, something completely unimaginable had happened. His followers, without wealthy benefactors, without political power, and without armies, had multiplied across the empire in a way that is unparalleled in the rest of human history. The Roman emperors themselves were Christians. The empire had moved largely from pagan worship to the worship of the God of Israel. Jesus had conquered the Roman world, not by armies and manipulation and alliances, but through a group of followers walking in obedience to his teachings to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, and to see sacrifice and service as the ultimate act of power and trusting him. To someone standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus died around the year 30, it would have been completely unimaginable. God's plan was being accomplished, but not through any of the means that people expected or could have anticipated. Is it possible that God wants to do a similar work here and now? Something so big and unlike this world that we can't even fathom it. And that we're like Abraham or Saul thinking that the only way to get there is to quit waiting for God and to do things our own way. Do we trust God enough to say, I will turn the other cheek even if it makes me seem weak. I will go the extra mile even when it seems like I'm sending the wrong message. I will love my enemy even if it means my political party might lose power. Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. If God tells us that our faith is going to look foolish sometimes, then we shouldn't be surprised if sometimes we have to make choices as Christians that make us feel foolish. One of the ways I see this most in the United States right now is in the pursuit of institutions. There, there's nothing wrong with trying to accomplish God's will through a political party. But once we begin compromising who God has told us to be and what he has told us to pursue in order to stay in power or score points or hang on to this institution, we start to look a lot like Saul who saw the Philistines closing in and his army running away and deciding, it's time to make mat take matters into my own hands. I'm sure God will be on board and he hasn't shown up yet. If you're thinking, but this political party is better than that political party. I have to ask, is it possible that God doesn't depend on any political party to bring about his kingdom? Is it possible that the God of the universe who moved through the entire Roman empire with 12 followers of a carpenter's son from an oppressed people doesn't need a political party to accomplish his goals. Have we considered that when we disregard what Jesus says, because there seems to be a more effective way that we might actually be undermining what God is trying to do? If we want the world's results, man, we should keep trying the world's methods. But I long for something that is so much bigger than that. It is a good thing that God isn't working through the worldly means, because we have thousands of years of human history and countless civilizations to point to, to say, this just doesn't work. When people use power to overthrow oppressors, it doesn't take long for them to become the oppressors themselves. It doesn't take long when we're hating our enemies before we start to forget that they are also created in God's image and loved just as deeply and fully as you are. It doesn't take long after we've made compromises with people who lie and cheat and abuse before our hearts grow hardened and calloused to those things and we lose our sensitivity to the spirit. We don't need a Christian nation. We need the kingdom of God. 
We don't need influence. We need obedience. We don't need power. We need to trust in the one who is all powerful. And I personally love that God doesn't put all the results on us. John 15 says Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And if we live our lives in him, we will bear good fruit. God's plans will move forward. His will will be accomplished. If our focus is on Jesus, we, we won't be able to help it. But our goal isn't accomplishing anything. Our goal is to draw close to God and fruit is just the byproduct of that. The ends, the master plan is above our pay grade. And all we need to do is faithfully trust and walk in what he calls us to. And when I'm focusing on Jesus well, personally, the ways God uses me, the fruit that I bear, isn't at all what I would have planned on my own. I find myself unexpectedly in deep conversations about faith with people I never would have expected. I see opportunities to serve and love people and I, that I would have otherwise completely missed. And, and none of it feels like work. And I compare the results of that and the fruit I see in that compared to what I try and do when I'm working it out on my own and with things like networking or building a resume or, or building a YouTube following and the results are incomparable. I, I, I am just flabbergasted by what God accomplishes in those small moments when I am just abiding. This makes me ask the question, are there areas of my life where I've made compromises for convenience's sake? Have we let slide our standards on telling the truth? Have we slipped from love for our enemies into disdain and disgust for anyone on the other end of the political spectrum or who has different views on masking or vaccination? Have we started justifying striking back rather than turning the other cheek? Do we follow and elevate people who embody the fruit of the spirit, love and peace, patience? How about self-control and gentleness? How much are we focusing on gentleness as a fruit of the spirit? God is at work doing big things in the world and he'd like for us to join in them. But if we want God's results, we need to use God's methods, even when it seems foolish, even when it, they require more patience than we expected, even when it feels as though our enemies are closing in around us. In Isaiah 30, a foreign army is bearing down on Jerusalem from the north. And God tells his people, wait and trust me. And instead, they see the political and military power of Egypt to the south and they decide, that's a better bet. We're going to go make an alliance with them. And that's what they do. And God says, oh, stubborn children who carry out a plan, but it's not mine, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit. They add sin to sin. It's not hard to imagine God saying the same thing to us today when we run to institutions or political parties or compromise the teachings of Christ in order to accomplish what we think makes the most sense. Oh, stubborn children who carry out a plan but not mine and who make an alliance but not of my spirit. As Christians, not only do the ends not justify the means, we know that the ends are outside of our control and in the hands of a God who is infinitely more powerful and capable and who has unimaginably better vision for the world. And he's going to use us to accomplish that. But when we humbly take up our crosses and follow him. Thanks for joining me today. This is a different kind of video than usual, but it's just been weighing on my heart. If you want to see what videos are usually like here, you can check it out here. I can't promise what future content will look like on this channel, but I can promise that I'll do my best to make it thoughtful and well-reasoned uh, and post it on a consistent-ish schedule. If that sounds like your kind of thing, like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. And on the other hand, if unreasonable and superficial is more your speed, you're welcome to stick around too.